Well, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Welcome here to Mid Cities Bible Church. I'm Pastor George, and glad to see y'all here. And uh, praise the Lord. Um, beautiful, beautiful Texas weather. Amen. Sunshine, blue skies. Uh, just want to uh, shout out to the, the to uh, uh, with many that pitched in and helped out uh, with setting up for the memorial for Howard Green yesterday. And uh, just let you all know to continue, continue to pray for the Green family and also uh, for the gospel was presented. Pray for there for any souls that were here that not that have not trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Pray for the Holy Spirit to work on their heart and draw them to Him. Now, also this morning, uh, we have a special celebration this morning. We have baby dedication for Zacharias, so this will be good too. But uh, praise the Lord. We have uh, opening announcements here just to let you know. If you're a visitor this morning, if you could, fill out one of the visitor cards that's on one of the chairs near you. And uh, the tab at the bottom, you can put your email on there, name, and just stick the tab in one of the boxes at the back of the sanctuary here. And we'll be sure to get back with you. If you've got any questions, you should check the block, uh, what area there. Also, here's the Mid-Cities Bible Church. This is our website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel. And so we do record our services. And then also we uh, upload it onto our YouTube channel each Sunday. So you can always go back, look at the messages there. Also, we have here is our QR code for if you want to join up on the realm. This is like our social network. It's kind of like a quasi-Facebook, but it's for us as believers, as a body of believers. We're able to pray for one another, uh, list prayer requests, praises, also a reminder of events that are coming up in the ministry of our church here. So uh, be able to follow along there at the realm. All men's breakfast, uh, we, we usually have that every Saturday, first Saturday of each month, and it's at 8.30 a.m., and uh, Danny makes some great pancakes, so always come out. Poema Foundation will be going out this next Saturday. If you're interested in doing it, be sure to get on there and register by Wednesday. That way they're able to know on how many are coming. But uh, keep this, if you're unable to participate on Saturday, keep it as an important item of prayer. This is a ministry uh, to reach those children caught up in human trafficking in the North Texas area. And so we distribute flyers to businesses around the area here with their pictures so that if somebody sees them and recognizes them, they can call an anonymous tip line and they can be rescued. And uh, we've seen this work. Pray for the Lord to continue to use this ministry and pray for the salvation of those souls of every one of those children. Pray for them because spiritually they need deliverance too. Also, if you have musical gifts, you can sing. We uh, want to serve the Lord in our worship team. Uh, be sure to get with me. Let me know. Uh, we've got an opening right there. Musical gifts are needed and a heart to want to serve the Lord. Also, David, do we have that picture up there? Yeah, from the... Oh, well, no, I, I want to shake this up. I want to shout it out. Huh? Yes, yeah, she is. Right there. And I'm not even wearing my glasses. I'm not even wearing my glasses, folks. Well, I'm going to shout it out anyway. Okay, Kaylee Smith wrote out an essay, and through that essay, she was chosen as she went with her class, school class, to go to Washington, D.C. They went to the tomb of the unknown soldier, and because she was selected and won on that essay, she got to place the wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier as she slides down in the chair there. But that's okay, Kaylee. It's, this is praise the Lord. It is praise the Lord. That's, that's a, mon, a monumental event in her life, her families, and praise the Lord Jesus Christ how he brought that about. And uh, that's, that's good stuff. So whenever we have something like that happen in our church body, our family, we want to celebrate it. And I love to celebrate stuff like that. That's, 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 that's the next generation of the Lord working, you know? Hey, there it is. Did you see that? Thank you, David. It's right there. Right there. Well, let's watch this video and prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together here and let's pray. As you get ready to worship our Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you. Praise you for each day, your many blessings you pour out upon us. Father God, it's by the Spirit of God we're able to cry out, Abba, Father. We have been adopted into the family of God through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, you're our shepherd, our Savior, our Master, our Lord. Lord Jesus, we want to praise you this day. We want to praise you this morning as your people. As we're united together here, we pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit, the leading guide. We pray that you would be glorified, Lord. Remove from our thoughts, off our hearts, all distractions and any lies of the enemy. Guide and lead us as your people in that time of worship here together today. Minister through your holy word. Minister in hearts and lives. Speak to all that need to hear. We pray for your holy work. We praise you, our Lord Jesus. You died on that cross for us, and we're reminded of this as we partake the Lord's Supper and the communion this day. We are reminded our salvation is because of you. Our life is because of you, eternal life. Each day, it's all about you, Lord. You make it possible. We pray all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross is spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen no heart can fully know how glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful one, I love you. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. special scripture 
reading here this morning. Andy, Andy. Thank you. Sorry. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. Amen. Thank you. Amen.
Jesus coming back? Say amen. His word promises it, doesn't it? See, we don't have to check the Tao. We don't have to wait till November to see what's going to happen next. We don't have to wait for those guys to join together and do whatever they do in Davos. The word of God says Jesus is coming again. And everything God promises in his word, he fulfills. I trust you know Jesus is your Savior this morning, this day, this life. He makes all the difference in the world.
Yes, Lord, it is my victory. So, our Lord Jesus, we praise you each day. You're a holy work in our lives. The indwelling Holy Spirit in His work. Your guiding hand, your protection, your provisions, and your presence. Lord Jesus, keep us close to you. Let your sheep not stray, but draw us unto you, dear shepherd. And we praise you. We praise you. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. of uh, baby dedication. And what this is, is a time for David and Gabrielle to seek to make a commitment before the Lord that they will raise Ezra in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Because as parents, you know, we need Jesus to work in the lives of our children. That thing, come on magic touch. Look at that. He's got the Midas touch. That's why he's one of our elders here. As soon as I saw that, I said, Andy, we got to get him on the board.
fact, the Word of God tells us, and we can trust God's Word, amen? God's Word tells us that the enemy, he has a certain future destination in time by God's decree. He will not win. Jesus Christ has won. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This morning, I want you to, if you will, turn with me in your Bibles to first starting in Psalm 3411. Psalm 3411. I want to read just a few scriptures that has to do with parents and the children and the Lord. Psalm 3411. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. You know, also, we're told there in Proverbs 1, 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Foolish don't want to listen, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that is the idea, you're not running around, afraid you're, every time there's a thunderstorm, you're going to get zapped by lightning. The idea of fear there is reverence for the Lord. You hold Him, high esteem, you recognize that he is, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, and he is my Lord and Savior. And I am to love him with all my heart, mind, and soul. Amen? As a believer in Christ, we've been adopted into the family of God, and we have been forgiven of all of our sins. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we do not walk alone. We do not walk alone in this world. Jesus is with us. And I encourage you this morning, if you've been attacked, you've been under artillery fire by the enemy, and you've been, you've been feeling like things aren't going right, you know what? Things have gone right. Jesus already won. He died on that cross. The rule of this world, he says, judged, is now judged. And we could trust Jesus Christ every step of the way. And you know what? He's coming again. Now some of us, it's all according to God's timing, we will get to see him face to face. We don't know when, but we know we will. See, no matter what this world will throw at you, dear brother and sister, We are safely in the hands of Jesus Christ. We have no cause for fear or alarm. Now, I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, nor a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Those of y'all that know that you're minor prophets, you know where that's from. But I can tell you this. I think a lot of us, even the unsaved in this world, are seeing the handwriting on the walls of what's going on in this world, what's going on in our country. And just as those gathered together to try to build the Tower of Babel, <laughs> we're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to, we're going to reach up into the heavens this. We're going to do this together. We're going to, whew, no. Because to glory be to God. To God be the glory, and Him alone is to be glorified. Look with me also over to Ephesians the book of Ephesians another portion of God's word chapter 6 beginning in verse 1 in Ephesians there are, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and talks about children and about parents he says there are children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right children Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Do you hear that? Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you, and that you may live in the, long in the land. And then Paul adds this. Dads, listen up. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Why does he say that? Well, the idea here is for men, for us as fathers, to provoke our children is to exasperate them, to, to put too many demands, to be riding them. You know, we, 
they make wrong choices and wrong decisions but do we lovingly respond and seek to help them and guide them back to the right relationship where they need to be just as our Heavenly Father does Hebrews he will chasten us just as a father loving father chasing his own children bring them back but see it's very easy to put too much and and it may be a situation where you just got too much going on at work too much going on at work busy week stress anxiety all these things now, I know I'm guilty there were times our children right now our oldest son's 31 so we kill him even when he disobeyed we have another son is 30 our daughter 28 but with those three kids I remember going through those teen years hello teen years how many how many parents here get ready still their children haven't gone through the teen years yet okay well in a moment now I'm gonna have David Gabrielle come up here with Ezra pray as a church body as believers pray for one another for the Lord to give you give these parents strength wisdom and guidance and protection over their families in a hostile world that does not love Jesus and it opposes all that God seeks to do because the lies he's the father of lies Jesus said that that's his resume first line of his resume Oh, I see here you're a father of lies. Yeah. Yeah. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And I, I would say to you that for those who are single parents, my wife was raised by a single parent at an early age in the 60s. You take that step forward and allow the Lord to use you to raise those children in the fear and admonition of the Lord and you pray for them daily you pray for the Lord Jesus Christ to protect them daily I still pray for our kids every day no matter how good things seem to be going why because I know the enemy why I know this world right okay enough said well this time I'd just like to ask if David and Gabrielle if y'all would join me up here with Ezra and if you have family that's wanting to come up here and stand with you by all means please come up here and join us <clears throat> Look at, boy, don't he look good? Look at that. Woo! <laughs> Gabriel. Amen. Three months old tomorrow, folks. Three months old, right? I was going to ask, now, is, is there anything, Gabriel, you or Dave would like to say? Uh, yeah, I could. Uh, there we go. Oh, it's okay. It's just a nook. <laughs> There you go. Oh, you want to say something? No. Nah. No, nah, I didn't really plan on saying too much. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, we got plenty of family and friends here. Amen. Um, and obviously the church family. Uh, we appreciate everybody. Uh, just thank you for everything that y'all have done for us. My bad, man. Uh, thank you for everything that y'all have done for us, uh, everything that y'all meant to us. Uh, yeah, there's not too much you got to do. Take it back off of that. Thank you for everything. Especially Katie, thank you so much for reaching out. Um, thank you for all the prayers. Um, and we love y'all. Thank you. Amen. Well, the Lord bless each and every one of you. And I know y'all are behind now. Praise God. I'm tell you, there's some that have children and they don't have family, loved ones around them like this. Lord bless each and every one of you and continue to use you in their lives. Amen. And on that, 
what they're doing is is this is baby dedication they're they're making this dedication their commitment to the lord jesus christ again to raise ezra to raise ezra in the fear and admonition of the lord to teach him of jesus christ from the earliest times that he might come to jesus and be born again because remember that which is born of flesh is flesh but that which is born of spirit is spirit yes i like to ask our church family if y'all would please everybody stand up because see part of this as a church body as believers together in the body of christ i want to challenge you to pray for david and gabrielle and ezra pray for the lord to protect them to guide and give them strength wisdom discernment as they raise this dear little boy that god's given them and that he'll come to know jesus at an early 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 age yeah. the faith of a child yeah. jesus said and also to be their support at times when they need they need us they need us as believers in the body of christ be there for them let's pray let's pray our heavenly father praise you for little ezra lord you you provided your son that we might be saved sinners saved from all our sins and receive that gift of eternal life and we praise you for how you've provided david and gabrielle with this dear little boy minister even now lord jesus to his heart with every word of god that he has heard that is spoken to him and in his presence speak to him lord we pray for the ministry of your holy spirit in his heart and as well in david and gabriel gabriel's heart strengthen them spiritually in the midst of this spiritual battle they we walk every day that they stay close to you lord protect them remind them correct them and lord jesus bless this home bless this family all for your glory and I pray, Lord Jesus, for your blessings and your work in the lives of each of their loved ones and family members here today that have come out here and to rejoice this time and celebrate this dear blessing. And we just praise you now, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Y'all be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much. And on that, turn in your Bibles to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Take care of there, Nancy. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3. Hey, they, they love working with the youth. And uh, we have a building right over here. It's got a lot of people pitched in, fixed it up, repaired. And then a large group of volunteer ladies came out yesterday morning and cleaned it, spick and span. So that's our stepping stones ministry. So praise the Lord for that. But I ask you to turn in your Bibles there to Galatians because we're, we're continuing our study in the book of Galatians. And this morning is verses 23 to 26 of chapter 3, the purpose of the law, part 2. Now, if you remember back, you got good memory, like I don't, you remember back in part 1. Part 2, Paul lays out the important truth of the purpose of the law. 
the churches in Galatia had been misled by teachers that were saying that you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, but you also must live according to the law of Moses. And if you don't, you will not be saved. That means you have to observe the Sabbath. You, uh, men have to be circumcised. All boys need to be circumcised. All these things. It's Jesus plus the law. Jesus plus works. Jesus plus human effort. And you know what? We're sinners, and we cannot contribute. We cannot contribute anything to our salvation. You believe that? We can't. That's why Jesus came. That's why God sent forth his son. It's because we, we do not have the ability to be righteous before God. The only way that you and I can be declared righteous is through faith in Jesus Christ, him alone, and what he's already done, his sacrifice. Let's pray. Father in heaven, guide us now in your holy word by the Spirit of God. Teach us according to each of our needs, Lord Jesus, in your sight. You see all. I pray now, Lord, if there's any here that doesn't know you as their, their, as their Savior, they have not believed upon you, I pray for your Spirit's ministry, and I pray for you to speak to them. Draw them to you, Lord. We pray for your Holy Word. Prepare our hearts to receive it. Teach us in your Word. Feed us, Lord. Nourish us for our life. Our life to live with you and to live for you. Lord Jesus, we commit this time for your glory. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The purpose of the law, Galatians 3, verses 23 to 26. If I could have a volunteer here to read. We usually we just offer them down there. Okay, I've got a couple hands up. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. The law acted as a guardian until Christ came. Verses 23 to 24, Paul brings this fact out that, it, that the law, there was a purpose. God had a purpose for the law. But unlike what the Judaizers were teaching the churches in Galatia, he was, they were teaching them again and again that the gospel Paul preached was not the right gospel. They were even teaching that Paul really was not an apostle and that he had to go down to Jerusalem and get taught by Peter and John and the rest of the apostles there. And so throughout this letter that Paul writes to the churches in Galatia, he corrected that and refuted each and every one of those claims. Because see folks, the minute you start introducing anything to the gospel, anything to who Christ is, anything to his saving work on that cross, you have now distorted the truth of God. And the salvation that's in his son. And what will happen as here, the minute that legalistic mindset, that pharisaical mindset comes in with these new laws, and, and you got to live this way, do this, eat this way, assert, uh, witness and worship only on these days. When you start doing that, it will undermine the faith of believers. Your faith will be undermined if you begin to think, I contribute something to this salvation. See, Jesus saves. Amen? It's Jesus and Him alone. As we've been learning here, and I've been pointing out, throughout our life now as believers in Jesus Christ, all of it is about Jesus, 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 Jesus. The gospel message declares Jesus. The gospel message declares that through Jesus Christ you can be saved, you can be forgiven of all your sin. And the law acted as a guardian until Christ came. The law kept them in custody. Notice there, Paul says they held captive. Now, before faith came, he's talking about Christ. When we were held captive, the idea there is to be kept in custody. It, 
imprisoned until the coming faith. The idea of imprisonment is that meant to be closed in on all sides. Under custody. Now somebody might wonder, well, why? Why, well, why, was it, why did God use the law that way with Israel? Why did he use the law? Well, see, the reason was God chose his people Israel. And he chose them through Abraham. He called Abraham. And then he promised that covenant he made with Abraham, and the everlasting covenant was also reaffirmed to Isaac and to Jacob, and then the sons of Jacob. They went into bondage. First they went in as, as with the lands of Goshen, the best farm lands there in Egypt, and then it became bondage. After 400 some years, the Lord sent Moses in, calls them out, they meet there at Mount Sinai, and he gives them the law. And the reason for that was to hem them in, to keep them in custody, to imprison them, close them in on all sides. Why? Is because they were in the midst of a world, and that part of this world, where they were pagan, they were sacrificing their children in the in land of Canaan. God warns them, before you go into the land, do not do, do not worship the gods they worship, do not sacrifice your sons and daughters unto Molech. There was horrible, perverse actions by societies in that day. And the law was to hem in the people of Israel and set them apart as a holy people unto the Lord God, the only true God, the creator God, the great I Am. See, the law was never meant to be a rule book to live by so that you can be made righteous. Otherwise, Jesus didn't need to come. He says they're held captive, in prison, closed on all sides. And he says until the coming face would be revealed, the coming of Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, many times by the prophets, going back even to Moses, they foretold of a coming one. And Moses says, he will come, one like me. Him you shall hear. Job talked about, I know my Redeemer lives and shall one day stand upon the earth. He did. Jesus did. You see, the prophets told Isaiah 53, said that all we like sheep have gone astray and we turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. See, the prophet, who was the prophet Isaiah you're talking about? That coming faith, the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Mm. And see, the law kept them in custody. It kept them separate from all of the lifestyles, the false worship, the false gods, all of those things that were fully in progress and in, in effect throughout there, not only in Egypt where they were, but as they went into the land of Canaan. You read through there. Don't take my word for it. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures. You'll see. He writes out, says that the land of Canaan is vomiting out the inhabitants because of those practices that were going on. And he lists them. And he warns Israel. No, the law was to keep them in custody. See, nowadays, folks are supposed to be kept in custody because they could be an endangerment to themselves or to other innocent people in our neighborhoods and in our cities. Right? Verse 24, the law acting as a guardian until Christ came. The guardian, the law, prepared for justification by faith. Now, that's a big word, and I'll give you a definition here. Those of y'all have been driving with us here. We're, we're gonna, I'll get you the map out and show you where we're at. The guardian prepared for justification by faith. That word guardian, paiodagogos, paiodagogos, it's hard to find something correlating in our culture, in our society today, that matches up right with that. Uh, there are those that suggest tutor. So I put that up there as a tutor. Most of us know about if you're in college or something and uh, you're, you're real bad at math, uh, you need a tutor. That tutor will come alongside and work with you and teach you about the math. But here the guardian was of those families, they would appoint a guardian to watch over the child's behavior at home 
but also when they went away from home to school, they watched over their behavior. They corrected them. They instructed them. See, the parents didn't do that. The guardian did. The law, so then, conclusion, what Paul just said in 23, the law was our guardian until Christ came. So see, to have those that proclaim to be believers in Christ to come from Jerusalem, to come out and to travel, and they were traveling behind Paul to each of those churches that the Lord used him to plant, to all the churches he planted, and to tell them, well, it's not just Christ. You have to live by the law. And so that's why at the beginning of this book of Galatians, Paul says, if anyone preaches another gospel than the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed anathema and folks I want you to know there are many false gospels preached today these false gospels add to the gospel message these false gospels take away from the gospel message what is that gospel message Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures Paul told the Corinthians there in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians he said this is the gospel you receive this is the gospel that we preach to you and folks that gospel is true today it's true to every man woman and child on this earth doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter what job you have. Doesn't matter what degrees you have. But as a sinner, God the Father has provided His Son that you can come to Him and trust Him that He died on that cross and paid the penalty for your sins and cry out, Lord Jesus, save me. Believe it, He rose from the dead. And you will be born again. Born of the Spirit. That's why Jesus said, marvel not, I say to you, you must be born again. You, and that's it. It's a second birth. Born of the Holy Spirit. But they were saying, human effort. You've got to add human effort. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And folks, that's going to drive you crazy as a believer because you're going to end up being discouraged. You're going to realize, I can't live this. I can't always do what's right. I'm not perfect. I sin. I get angry. Sometimes I get angry with God. Sometimes I complain because God doesn't do what I want Him to do. We sin. We're sinners. But you know what? If you know Jesus Christ, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul will lay it out here in the book of Galatians of how as we surrender ourselves and submit to the Lord, confessing our sins and allow the Holy Spirit to work, He makes that change in you and me. It's by the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's not by you and me living by rules. It's by the spiritual power, the same power that made us to be born again, that we were baptized in the body of Christ, is now actively working each day. It can actively work as long as you and I surrender and say, okay, Lord, I'm taking our hands off the wheel. I mean, we're sitting in the passenger seat, and we're reaching over grabbing the steer wheel like that. Come on now. Come on, right? That happens. Pastors do it. Believers do it. Every now, just when you think, oh man, I got to stand, Lord. I'm, it's all you. Not me. Just nothing about me. Boy, something that we want or something that hits our heart tender, it could be anything. Fill in the blank. See, the just shall live by faith. We must walk by faith. And that includes, too, the, the sanctifying work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. By faith, trusting God's word, that work is being done in us. He says the guardian, usually the guardian was, would be a t uh, provided for that child, and they would be from the age of six years old up to about 16 years. Some would say from six years old up to puberty. But you get the picture of what that guardian was doing. He says there, until Christ came, the law was our guardian. In order that we might be justified by faith. That 
that idea there of justified by faith means to be declared, declared righteous through faith in Christ. It's Jesus Christ that makes us righteous. It's by faith that we come into that salvation. I believe it's personal faith. I believe just as Jesus rebuked those cities in his day, he said the works that have been done to you and you have not repented yet, he rebuked them because they would not repent. In our world today, simple faith, in Christ is what it takes based on what God's word says he died on that cross for my sins and he rose again the third day believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved God promises that in his word he'll make a change in your life I'm going to scratch that he'll keep making a change in your life That's just what loving, our loving Lord does. He keeps it. He keeps he, Philippians 1 says, that good work that's begun in you will continue until the day of Christ Jesus. There it is. There it is. And I encourage you, again, if you've been discouraged, you feel like the world's not paying you, you're having it hard, and you, you're struggling with depression, discouragement, disappointment, any of those things, that's the human experience. But by faith, Trust what God's Word said. And if our memory is short, go back into God's Word. Remind ourselves. Be recurred. And I, where do I turn? Man, most of our Bibles go to the back of the Bible. There you got a concordance. Look up. Those words, pick that key word. You're going to have Scripture references. Flip right over there to it and pray through it. Read through it. Meditate upon it. Right? The guardian prepared for justification by faith. It's... You're declared righteous through faith in Christ. You know, Paul, when he wrote to the Romans there, chapter 3, verses 22 through 23, he said the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. All who believe. All who believe. I want to make sure everybody here hears me. I got a southern accent. You might not understand me. All who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned. Do not worship a man. Do not worship a preacher. Do, what, do not worship a religious leader. Do not worship man. Worship God. Worship Jesus Christ. Don't worship your children. Don't worship your spouse. But worship Jesus. He has that place of priority. I'm going to tell you something, brother and sister, that makes a lot of difference with all we deal with in this life. Because that ain't a bed of roses. Life throws a lot of stuff at you. And sometimes the Lord allows us to go through stuff to test our faith. Huh? And you know what? It's revealing sometimes, isn't it? Oh, 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 I'm, I'm like them in the boat there. Lord, wake up, you care, we get ready to perish. But see, Paul tells this truth. It's the righteousness of God is through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. You must believe upon him. There's no distinction. All have sinned. The idea there is, is that uh, if I was illustrated, it's like if, if you and I were to take a baseball, okay, and we're going out to, we'll go down here to the Rangers part, and we get, up, we get a baseball, we stand there on home plate, and we try to throw that baseball out of that park, out of the stadium, standing on home plate. So I'll step up there, baseball, I love baseball growing up. You'll take that, but I'll take it, I'll hurl it as hard as I can at a 63-year-old decrepit body. So I'll take it like that and my shoulder hurt for the next month. Right? <laughs> and I'll throw it and I'll hit the center field wall. Then another one steps up. You take that baseball, you stand there, you take it, you throw it, and you hit up about, about 10 rows up in the bleachers there, out in center field. The idea all have sinned and come short is 
none of us are able to throw that ball out of the park. Some may throw it a little bit further. Some may be a little bit better. More, they're more good in the life they live and what they do. But you know what? All of us, by God's standards, which is righteousness, pure righteousness, we fall short. We have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the good news is God sent His Son, Jesus, to make it possible that you may be made righteous. And so when you're a believer, you become a believer, you're a believer this morning, when God the Father looks at you and me, He sees the righteousness of His Son. He does not see our sin. He sees His Son because we are in Him. Amen? Galatians 3.25, the law is no longer needed once Christ came. See, the purpose of the law was to be that guardian, to hold them in, keep them safe. But once Christ came, the law is no longer needed. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Faith has come, literally, that faith, faith in Jesus Christ, to believe upon Him. The Savior has come, the sacrifice. That's why Jesus said when He was here on this earth, He said, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill, to complete the law and the prophets. See, remember, Jesus was speaking to those Jewish disciples in a Jewish nation who have, for 400 years had not heard anything of a revelation of the Word of God. And then along came John the Baptist. And Jesus says, if you'll accept this, Elijah has come. He was to prepare the way of the Messiah. He said, I am a voice in the wilderness. Make, you, make ye the straight the way of the Lord. Right? And he's a cut. How about that? When they saw, you ever thought about that? Funny how the Lord uses family, uses them together. Faith in Jesus Christ, faith has come. No longer under, literally, the idea here is no longer necessary, folks. No longer necessary. See, in the Old Testament, they look forward to the coming Messiah. For you and I and the world today, we can point back and say, Messiah has come. Israel, hear O Israel, Messiah has already come, and he's coming again. Hear O world, the Son of God has already come. He walked upon this earth. It's not enough to acknowledge that, yes, I believe in the historicity of of Jesus' existence, and then he did come here and walk around upon there, and then he did probably live in there. You know, Josephus, the, the historian, pointed that out, and oftentimes mentioned Jesus, and blah, 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 blah. But, but the bottom line is, no, but he is the Son of God. There are those that preach Christ and deny that he's the Son of God, and they declare to be Christian. You cannot deny the Son of God. He is God. He suffered and died on that cross for you and me. What greater love than that? Huh? That's greater love than a parent can ever have. That's greater love than a spouse can ever have, even on their wedding day. That's a greater love because it's the love of God, and it's an unconditional love. And it makes it possible for you and I to be saved. In the Galatians 3.26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Many times here in Galatians and other parts of the New Testament, it is emphasized in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Here in Galatians, you have many passages where this is emphasized, like Galatians 2.4. Galatians 2.4 says, Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, that's the Judaizers, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. The theme of the book of Galatians is our freedom in Christ. Notice how he said that. In Christ Jesus. That's where this is possible. In Christ Jesus. 3.14. Galatians 3.14. So that in, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith, through faith, faith, that's what it is, faith, 
Verse 28, chapter 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's our standing in the body of Christ eternally. How about that? See, we don't have to worry about gridlock stopping it. It's God and God alone. Amen? Galatians 5, 6. There also. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Only faith working through love. In Christ Jesus, I've got it up there for you. The idea of this statement and that phrase being used multiple times throughout the New Testament is there's a personal, dynamic relationship of the believer to Christ. It's a personal relationship. It's dynamic, and it is part of that relationship. Jesus Christ did not come to start a religion. God is not about religion. Man's about religion. It's about a relationship. It's a personal relationship between you and Him. You and Jesus. Not because that's what mommy believes. Not because that's what daddy believes. Not because that's where we had to go to church and go to... No, it's a personal relationship. It's between you and Him. It's a dynamic relationship. Active. And that's why Paul brings it even further to the point of the law is gone. The focus is on Christ and faith. Because we're the sons, children, sons of God now. He predestined us, Ephesians 1.5, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Is that good news? I've had some friends that were adopted over the years. See, the idea is, as a sinner, we're separated from righteousness of God. We're outside the family of God. We come by faith in Jesus Christ. We're now adopted into the family of God. Look at the Romans 8, 14 to 15. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, the law, being under the law, remember? In, under custody see you have not did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry Abba Father Abba Father that's how we're able to do it is we've been born again it's truth it's spiritual truth it's a relational truth it's an eternal truth He's got us all the way now. And it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter what you've ever done. And you may have done against him. Blasphemed his name. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. Sons of God, children of God. So right now, while we're here on terra firma, we're encouraged by the Apostle Paul in Philippians to be lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Allow Jesus to shine through you. How do we do that, Pastor? You do it this way. Seek Him each day and live for Him and stay close to Him. Confess, keep your confessions. When you sin, confess short list. Confess it as sin. Don't measle, measle out with, well, you know, I kind of got a little, little uh, carried away there. And, and uh, yeah, no, you lost your temper. You became angry. That was wrath. You had anger in your heart 
Jesus said the issue is in the heart. Any many times a man looks at a woman, the lust for her in his heart, he's already committed adultery. See, that's where that's God sees. Man sees the outside. Jesus said, Pharisees, here's the law workers, the Judaizers, you clean the outside of the plate, but you don't clean the inside. Jesus cleans the inside. And when we sin, he's not surprised because he's omniscient. When Jesus went to that cross, he knew every thought, word, and deed that you and I would do before we were born. And God so loved the world. Father in heaven, thank you for your dear son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, speak to any that need to hear from you today according to your perfect will. Their spiritual need, I lift them up to you now, Lord Jesus, and I praise you for saving a wretched sinner like me. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thank you, George. So, number one, welcome everyone, um, those that we haven't met yet, I'm Josh, and um, we're going to move on to the next part of the service, we're going to do communion today, or the Lord's Supper as it's known, um, so to give some context and background, for those that may not have ever done this before, this is one of the sacraments of the church, along with baptism, that we do as part of the Lord's commandments of those that are believers following him, and this is done in a variety of different ways. It's done in a variety of different contexts. Um, and so today I'll kind of walk you through what this looks like. So if you've never been a part of it, um, you can be a little more comfortable with what's happening because sometimes walking into a new place and they're doing some things and you know, it can make you feel a little uncomfortable. Um, so first and foremost, I just wanted to specify that this is for the believer. This is something that is specified in the word for those who believe in Jesus Christ as their savior. So if that's not a decision that you've made, I would say this is not something that you probably want to partake in, and that's okay. This is completely voluntary. We're going to have our deacons come around and pass uh, these plates around, and if you want to join in, please feel free. And if you don't, you can just say no or pass along the plate. It's completely okay. We're not going to call anybody out or call anybody up here um, to, to, to specify whether you've done this or not. This is between you and the Lord, and if you want to join in with us as a group today, we would love to have you. So. With all that being said, we'll kind of jump in, and I am going to call one person up, but that person's related to me, so I think it's okay. Kaylee, come up here, please. She's going to help me out this morning. So if you guys were here at the beginning, you may have seen the pictures that George showed um, of, of Kaylee. This is my daughter. She got the chance to go to Washington, D.C. Um, this past week, and she went to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And for those that may not know what that is, that is a tomb in Arlington Cemetery that is designated to represent all of the fallen military folks across our country who have ever died that they were unable to identify. And so it's a place um, to recognize their service and for folks to go and have a place to find closure if their loved one was never recovered in battle. Um, and so Kaylee was able to go there and be a part of uh, a service there of putting the reef on the tomb of the unknown soldier which we we thought was very special so i wanted to ask her a couple of questions about that that's going to tie into what we're going to talk about so so kaylee and she did, i just told her this morning she was coming up here she doesn't know what i'm going to ask so when you were there in in that moment uh or, you know bringing the reef up would you describe to us kind of the feeling there of the tone how people felt how you felt just the feelings involved all right, so I would say, like, the first word that comes to mind is, like, sacred or solemn because you're paying respects to not just the two soldiers who are currently laid in the tomb, but to thousands of soldiers who never got the chance to be properly mourned for or recognized, and so you just feel really, like, heavy, um, like, your heart feels heavy and sorrowful almost because... You just want to do all you can to be respectful and to, like, respect and pay homage to almost all of those who died that we never really got the chance to know. Thank you. Second question, this last one. 
So what do you feel like is the purpose of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier now that you've seen it? I mean, I've never seen it. I've never been there. So you got to be there. You got to be a part of it. So when you think about it and you go forward in your life, like what do you think that tomb does for our country and for people? What do you think its purpose is? So I would say it's just really eye-opening about how such little things can have such a big impact. Like veterans and stuff who made it through these things, they probably knew some of the people who were never recognized or they were lost and they were never found again. And so it just impacted me a lot because it's like I take small things for granted. Like the people who are willing to do so much to sacrifice, you don't think about it every day. But it's kind of eye-opening when you really think about like People gave up everything to protect you, even though they don't even know who you are. And it really just makes you want to, like, think about them more often and pray for their families because they gave up their lives, their identity, their being, just to protect thousands of people who they don't, they didn't owe them anything. They didn't need to do that, but they did because they felt like it was the right thing to do. And it's just very, like... It feels very special and important. It makes you feel very loved. And you just really need to respect them as much as you can. Kaylee, thank you very much. Well, that is a uh, incredible segue into what we're going to talk about. So, <clears throat> again, the way this works is this is communion. In a minute, I'm going to speak a little bit about what this is. And I'm going to have our deacons come up, and they're going to pass out these elements. And as I read, it'll explain what these are and what they mean. Um, and then we'll take a little moment to just kind of be still, and then we'll we'll eat the cracker and we'll drink the cup together as a group. So that's kind of the process. But before we do that, I want to read some things about the Lord's Supper. This comes from the book of First Corinthians, and this is uh, chapter 11 starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So um, what I want us to think about, and honestly, I did not tell Kaylee, I didn't even tell her I was going to ask her any questions until this morning. So she's not here. She went away. But I want you to think about what she said. Because what she said is what I believe the Lord speaks to us about his communion which is we do this as a memorial to him and in remembrance of what he did and when we enter into this together we are like that tomb we are together remembering the great sacrifice that he made so that men could know him that we could know him and the other side of that that Kaylee answered for us is what does that mean for us going forward? It means that we proclaim his death until he returns. And that is through understanding the love of his shed blood, the sacrifice that he chose to make so that we go forward changed and can go proclaim to others this gospel. So that being said, the deacons would please come help pass the elements out. It may take us a second. And as I said, feel free to participate and not participate. It is definitely up to you individually. And so we'll pass these out, then we'll take a second. We'll do this together. While they're doing that, I'll give you guys a little context. In that book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to an entire church. He's writing to the church. And in our culture, in our society, many times the communion or the Lord's Supper is seen as very personal and individual, which it is. But in that time, in that place... He's talking to them as a group, as a whole. And this idea of we enter into this together as body of believers, as this local church, and as church of all believers together. And he's directing them 
as a group and he's telling them there were some things they were doing right and there's some things that they weren't doing right and one of the things he said they weren't doing right was that when they did their supper when they did their communion they would come together in a big group and some people would go over to the corner and just start eating some people would go get the wine and they'd get drunk and they'd be drunk and these people wouldn't get any food and he basically said you guys are missing the whole point of this the point of this is to remember this is a solemn moment where we're recognizing our Lord and we need to be in unity together while we do that and taking it seriously is very important but remembering to wait on one another to share with one another to love one another no matter who you are no matter where you're from no matter if you're socially economically high or socially economically low no matter what part of town you're from we wait on one another we love one another and we're doing this together as part of God's body so Another part of this is just remembering this is communion. This is unity together. All of us agreeing on the same thing, which is Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He died. He rose again, and he died for all men that they might be saved from God's wrath. And all believers united for all time do this act as a way to proclaim that across all times, all countries, and into the future until Jesus comes back, this will be done. And that is an amazing, amazing thing that we get to enter into. So it's not just, hey, this is a moment in our church where we do this. This is a sharing of the proclamation of Jesus Christ with the greater church and it will continue to resound throughout the generations and it will continue to be done just like people coming to salvation and people being baptized so it's a pretty cool thing we get to do and you should be excited about it because it's just like going to share the gospel with somebody we're going to say hey Jesus Christ died for you and you can be saved and that's a pretty awesome thing so I didn't get mine but that's okay we can do it I'm going to come get it right now Thank you, sir. And did, all right, are we done? We went all the way through. So we're going to do it together, guys. Let's take just a minute. I'm going to let these guys, let the deacons get some. We're just going to, uh, I'm going to say a little prayer. Let's take a couple of minutes of silence. And in that silence, you guys just take the elements as you want to together, okay? Lord Jesus, we love you so much, and we do recognize that you died for us. And just like that tomb that represents all the men and women in this country who died to, to give freedom and life, we recognize you gave your life. You shed your blood on a cross so that men could be spiritually saved from death. And you did that voluntarily, and you did that out of love. And Lord, that does change us, and that does help us understand more about God and how much really all men need you. So we thank you for your death. We thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood for this new covenant that you gave us that all men have an opportunity to be saved. And we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, guys. There we go. Um, we're also in our our communion. Part of our worshiping the Lord, part of our way of honoring the Lord, is to remember that He has asked us to help Him grow our church, to grow the body of Christ, and we do that partially through our tithing and it, through our honoring and giving back to him because just like today we've had this incredible blessing of the dedication of baby Ezra so many of you family members that have come and joined with us today and bringing more babies we, we're all like we're all, all sitting here going yay we want to hug all of them but we want to honor Christ by giving back some of what he has given to us and we do that through our tithings and our offerings we know you can do it online. You can do it in person. We have a, a tall box at the back of the sanctuary where you can just drop in whatever you want to do. Or you can mail in your check to 3224 Cheeks Barger Road in Bedford, Texas. And that makes it easy for us to do what we can do 
You know, some days we can do a lot, and some days we can only do a little bit. But God doesn't ask you how much. He wants you to give from your heart. And that's the most important part of all of it. So at this time, let's honor God by saying, Thank you, Lord. We appreciate how much you love us. Oh, my goodness. Your heart just continues to overflow daily and hourly. And we're so grateful. May we honor you by giving back just a portion of what we can so that we can spread your light, your love to everyone so that they can know your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity for us to show you how much we love you. Amen. Good morning. I'm Audrey Morrison, and we are so happy that we have so much support for David and Gabrielle and Ezra to see you all here this morning. This part of our service is called family sharing. Um, and one of the first things we do is we recognize anybody who may have a birth.
Hey, well, let's stand together here. After we finish service today, we are going to have uh, a shower over here. We have cake and all, so all are welcome. Please stay as we celebrate this time there with David and, and uh, also Gabrielle. Let's sing this one up. I stand amazed. How marvelous. So I encourage you, sing it out loud. Praise Him. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Nazarene and wonder how He could love me, a sinner condemned and weak. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall live. suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransom and glory, His face I at last shall see, will be joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me is my savior's love for me is his love true Amen, all the way, all the way. So we have baby get-together here, dedication, cakes, diapers, all. So please stay. We have this time together afterwards. And always like to say the Lord bless you and use you in the week ahead. We're dismissed.